So a warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us. If it's your first time in this session, you're very welcome. And if you've been here before, it's nice to see you again. We have our audience, which is you, but we also need a president. So my first job will to, is to hand over to the president of the Spiritual International Union, Minister David Bruton. David. Thank you very much, Alvin. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to have you join us uh, for our audience with the President this evening. Our subject tonight is something that I, I know beyond any doubt affects all of us, but perhaps more importantly, it also affects every single person in our world. And I speak, of course, of spirituality. Spirituality has to be part of our journey uh, in my opinion. But tonight we have two guests who I'm going to invite to share their thoughts and their ideas and their vast experience um, around this subject that I'm sure we will all find fascinating and it'll give us all the opportunity to ask and to learn more about this particular subject that I'm sure will help enhance our own spiritual development and spiritual journey. So first, I would like to welcome from not so sunny Aberdeen, mm -hmm. uh, Eileen Davis. Uh, Eileen you. has been working as a medium for over 30 years and has made a lifelong vocation of studying spirituality. You see, she's the perfect guest. She embraces her love of the beauty and diversity of different religious traditions and spiritual practices and has endeavoured to integrate a spiritual way of life with her work as a medium. As a child, Eileen frequently kept the company of spirit children who were more a reality than those in the material world and developed a great love of the metaphysical poets from an early age, a love and passion of which Eileen still has today. Eileen's first introduction to spiritualism was when, at 19 years of age, she entered a spiritualist church in her hometown of Aberdeen. The medium that night was no other than a gentleman called Gordon Higginson that I think one or two of you may have heard of. What an experience, and during the demonstration, um, it simply changed the course and direction of Eileen's life and marked the crossing of a spiritual threshold. Eileen received support and encouragement from the most respected mediums of the time and counts herself blessed to have known and touched the lives of such remarkable people. She's a tutor and course organizer at the Arthur Finlay College and has been for over 25 years. She's also the principal of the Summerland Trust in Aberdeen, a position she has dedicated herself to for over 13 years where the ethos is to embrace the needs of the individual. Mediumistic powers are not so much developed uh, as are revealed. Uh, when we recognize our true nature and we begin to remove all of the conditioning that prevents us from recognizing them as an integral part of who we are as spiritual beings. Eileen is without doubt devoted to her teaching and believes that creating a safe and nurturing environment where all can receive the encouragement uh, is so important in those early years. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Eileen and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Um, good evening and welcome or possibly good day because I know some of you in, are in different sort of time zones and I think it's quite remarkable that here we are, we can all unite together uh, just for a while and share our deepest beliefs that we cherish. Uh, for me, spirituality is something that is so vital to our mediumistic uh, awareness and development. It should be as two threads or twine woven together as one. We shouldn't ever departmentalize our spiritual life. Uh, what does spiritual or spirituality really mean? If we look at the word, it comes from the Latin spiritus, which means life and breath. So we could get a sense that um, it really reveals the word spiritual, how alive we are. 
And if we're really alive, that means we are present with our whole self, with all of our awareness. Now, awareness is something that is spoken about a great deal within the spiritist movement. Uh, but to fully be aware is to be absolutely and totally present to each moment, to everybody that you meet. Um, Thomas Keating, the wonderful Trappist monk, once said that we live as guests in the divinity of nature. And I think that's very, very beautiful and powerful because when we have this sense that all life is a miracle, everything um, is sacred and divine. And yes, where we are right now, wherever uh, you, it is that you live is sacred and holy. Now that doesn't mean we should go around in a pious way, but it means that to live a spiritual life is to uh, not only have awareness, but to live the authentic life where we find a sense of connecting from a place of the heart where we reach out to people. But what does it mean to be authentic? To be authentic isn't really about um, just a word. It's about allowing ourselves to become deeply in touch with who we really are and knowing that whoever we are and however we feel, it's enough. The spirit world once said that it's too great a burden uh, to try and be perfect. But what we need to do is to perfect our love. And I think that's a very, very beautiful thing because we may be, as Silver Birch said, we can't possibly um, like everybody, but maybe we can look at them from a point where we all unite. And when we do that, it becomes easier um, to be in the company of those who maybe don't necessarily share our views or opinions or sometimes can be very challenging. I think for me, the important thing is to live a life with loving awareness. And for me, spiritualism opens many doors in so many ways, and it should lead us to the threshold of our own awakening, our own understanding. Sometimes uh, people have had a tendency to get a little bit caught up in the message, but it's much more work because it really leads us to that place where we realize that we are eternal beings, that the real self can never die. And if that's true, then what are we doing with our life? You see, birth and death are but doors with, where our sacred spirits pass. And it's so beautiful when we realize that we are as guests here upon the earth. We're not here forever. And are we going to leave the world the richer, the better for having passed, you know, passed through. Because when we touch one thing with deep awareness, we touch everything. We touch all life. Because everything everywhere is an expression of the divine or God or whatever name or label you care to call God. So it's living the authentic life, spirituality, it's living with awareness. So awareness really is something very, very sacred because very often now we live at such a fast pace in our life and we don't have time to truly touch people and connect. It's about listening beyond the words. When someone shares and speaks to you, sometimes people feel um, others don't really want to hear how they really are. So it's fully connecting. And as we connect, we realize that we all are one family, the family of man, irrespective of what culture we um, um, are brought up in, what religious tradition. You know, there are many lamps, but the light is one. And so when we have this realization that everybody has their right to think differently, act differently, and, um, you know, we can look at where we can share commonality, a meeting place. So spiritualism has such a vast capacity to touch lives because religion, it can be said, uh, is something that can separate, but spirituality unites. It unites us all together as one. And it, like love is a common, um, it's a universal language. Everybody can uh, experience the capacity to be touched by love. So it's really about living a life through a lens of perception where we see things as they really are and recognize that everybody everywhere um, is divine. 
And for me, that's really what spiritualism and spirituality is about, you know, because spiritualism, yes, we believe in life eternal and that this is something everybody shares, but what are we doing? How are we living our life? Are we using the knowledge that we have as spiritual beings, as people who are spiritually aware and making a difference? And I think that's a challenge uh, that we live, um, that is uh, calling to us at this present moment in our lives. Are we living a life where we are nourishing uh, the power of our own spirit? Do we take time to sit in the stillness and the silence. Um, these things are very, very important because we can only give from a full cup. We can't give from an empty cup. And so spirituality is about tapping into the universal power of life itself. We should all be living to the sound of gratefulness. So often we get caught up, don't we, in all that's wrong with the world. And um, I think sometimes we need to remind ourselves that life is a miracle, that existence is something incredibly powerfully sacred and divine. And when we look through the eyes of love, um, you know, incorporating spiritual practices, that's one little thing I think that spiritualism could do more is encouragement of um, practicing different spiritual um, techniques in many ways. A lot of people want to perfect their mediumship, but you know, and if we have developed mediumistic powers of awareness, we will leave that behind when we um, leave or kiss goodbye to our physical body. But when we've worked on our inner self, our inner life, our inner nature, we will take that with us throughout all eternity. And, and so I think that, you know, find and explore what spiritual practice you could do. Um, I use a mantra, which is, I am loving awareness. And that's simple. But when you look through the eyes of loving awareness, magic and wonder of existence uh, opens up. And something sacred moves within you. Thank you, Arlene. That's, that's amazing. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. My second guest this evening um, is Minister Matthew Smith. Matthew came into spiritualism in the late 1970s and was privileged, very much like Eileen, to see many of the great mediums of the past who shared their mediumship in such a natural and evidential way. His learning was a student at the Arthur Finlay College and he's been working as an AFC tutor and course organiser for many, many years. He understands how it feels to unfold, unfold these wonderful abilities which lie within the human form because it has gone through that process of, an, of opening up. In the early days of teaching, he discovered that many spiritual mediums lack confidence. So he actually asked the spirit world about this and was told that the lack of confidence is necessary in some people to enable us to blend with the medium. An interesting concept. Then, when mastered, that confidence grows because the medium is naturally empowered by the power. All of Matthew's courses carry both theoretical and practical elements to help the novice medium in their unfoldment. He has studied his own mediumship and still does, and that is vital for everyone as their spirituality grows. Mediumship is like a meandering pathway. You never know quite where it's going to lead you. But through our trust, we grow together as one. His background is theatre and entertainment, and he trained at the Birmingham Theatre School and has in the past worked in both television, theatre and film, combining his acting and developing clowning skills and worked very successfully as a professional clown. Those that don't know Matthew will know that he need to know he has a wonderful sense of humour mm -hmm. and sitting around a table with him in many meetings, he just brings that forward beautifully. It's wonderful. In August 2008, he was ordained as a Minister of the Spiritualist National Union 
and therefore now looks upon his role as a teacher in a pastoral manner. His approach is direct, never rude or abrupt, but constructive to help the discerning student. If you ask his opinion, you will get an honest answer. The work within Spirit has taken him practically all over the world in the years of service. The AFC is the beacon of light and when Arthur Finley bequeathed his home to spirit the Spiritualist National Union, the physical in the physical world he didn't quite know that an international airport would be on its doorstep. Clearly the spirit world did. So Matthew, welcome very, thank you for being with us and uh, I'd like now you to do very much what Eileen has done and just give us a few thoughts on your understanding of spirituality. David, um, I talk to you ladies and gentlemen in the power of love wherever you may be. The world at the moment is very much in need of guidance from all religions but don't let's confuse spirituality and religion. They don't have to walk together. It's about you as an individual, how you think, your motivation, your intention. Because as natural law says, every action carries a reaction. I was visiting the local hospice a few days ago and one of the ladies there, we, we say hello, she knows, me, she knows me quite well from my visits to the hospice and she said to me, I understand you're a spiritualist and I said yes. She said, well, I haven't got a belief, I'm an atheist. And I said to her, well, you've got a belief then. And she looked at me rather strangely. I said, well, if you don't believe in something, that's a belief. And she said, I never thought of it like that. But I share that with you because this lady, from what I've observed, is the most kindest, caring and loving person that I've ever witnessed in that hospice, but she doesn't follow the religion. So don't let's confuse the two. If spiritualism has spiritualized you, then it's done doing its job. It's making you realize and helping you to understand that you are a spirit with a physical body. You're not a physical body with a spirit. And how we live our life dictates our continued life. You're born with gifts and talents, some of which you've inherited from your parentage, others you've developed along the way. But nobody has the right to tell you how to be a, a, a sensitive. Nobody has the right to tell you how to live your life. You have to find your own way. Earlier today, somebody sent me this, and it was voiced some years ago by Martin Luther King. And I thought it was very appropriate to talk about this, to bring this into our session tonight. Martin Luther King obviously said many things, and he did a lot of good. But this is one of his quotes. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. By our peaceful thoughts, we bring light and love into the world and into our own lives. How true that is when it was said then, to as it's said today, to how it may be recited in 10 years, 50 years or whatever. Humankind has to learn compassion. 
for the benefit of their fellow being, whether that being be in the physical form, the animal, the nature, everything within our planet. We are all connected and interconnected. And those who share and work with their life, they don't want any praise for it. They're not waving a banner on high and saying, look how good I am. They're getting on with the work quietly in their own way. And utilize, if you don't do so already, utilize more the power of prayer. Talk to spirit. However you perceive God to be, develop that relationship. And if you are studying mediumship and spirituality, don't worry about guides, helpers and inspirers. Get to know your own spirit first. And then, when you become happy in who you are, your light will shine. We're not perfect, ladies and gentlemen. None of us are. If we were, we wouldn't be here. We've heard many times from the spirit world that this is a schoolroom. And it is. It is a schoolroom of life. And I've got no worries about going into the spirit world. No worries at all. And like many who also have the same thought, we don't worry about when we're going to go, it's how. <laughs> it's how we're going to go. But that is something too that we're not in control of. Your spirit has been born into this experience of life to live it, to enjoy it, to embrace it and to find that peace that stems from your, within your own powers. Your spirit doesn't know anything about obstacles. Your spirit doesn't know anything about boundaries. The power that is within you has no limits. We place the limits. And quite often we place them because somebody has told us we can't. Eileen spoke of that lovely mantra that she uses. The one I was given was, I am, I can, I will. And that's been very useful. Because although we appear to be confident, there is that insecurity within. And that's there because as David said in that uh, introduction, I believe that fragility is there within mediums to enable the spirit world to connect with us. Because if we thought we were the next best thing since sliced bread, the ego would be so big they couldn't connect with us. So celebrate. Celebrate who you are. Be who you want to be, not what others expect you to be. Live in the light of your love. And just to conclude, the word love, split it up. L is light, O is of, V is varying, E is energy. That's who you are. You are a light of varying energy according to the circumstances and situations you may be in. We're, we are a multifaceted diamond and people see different facets of our personalities according to our association with them. And then when we are called home, not the physical home, I mean the spiritual home. When we are called home, this diamond goes back to that larger power. It will add more luster. Why? Because in the experience, your spirit 
has been polished. Thank you, Matthew. Two wonderful, descriptive, inspired explanations of that sp word spirituality. Eileen, I'd like to begin by asking you, do you believe that our spirituality can be affected by the actions of other people in our life? Well, I think that is uh, obviously one of the challenges that we have and we face very often um, in the circumstances we find ourselves in. Um, when I said in the short talk that I use the mantra, I am loving awareness, that is a practice that I obviously apply every day and it helps me cope uh, with difficult situations and sometimes when people are very challenging I think it's really important to look behind the action to the need within the individual because when somebody's behaving in a way that's challenging it's very often because they're coming from a place of fear so it's a choice we make uh, can it affect our spirituality I think if we stayed anchored and present in our own self and remember that whatever is causing someone to behave in such a manner, there will be, it's because they're coming from a place of pain and their own suffering. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Matthew, could spiritualists be more spiritual? <laughs> Does the Pope pray? <laughs> Constantly so, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got to go to the fifth principle, haven't we, David, really? But, you know, it's the old chestnut. Um, it, it, it's up to them. Yeah. But you can't... If you're going to be a spiritualist, you can't be a spiritualist at the divine service or at the healing service and then um, be a heathen the rest of the week. I mean, because you're just deluding yourself. Um, so in short, David, they should, they should, but they've got to find the route. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you very much. Alv, uh, can we open the meeting up now to uh, our audience? And uh, I don't know whether you've got any questions in the chat box, but uh, if not, we open the floor. We've not yet, but I'm sure there are some on their way. So if you have any questions for our panel, uh, if you'd like to raise your hand, which is the button at the bottom of your participants box, or if you'd like me to ask them on your behalf, then just type them into the chat box and I'll ask them on your behalf. We've had lots of positive comments so far, so people have really enjoyed those descriptions of spirituality. Um, and uh, Ben made the comment that there are sometimes a lot of Sunday spiritualists. So I think you know, that's talking about the need to practice our spiritualism and spirituality for the entire week, not just on a Sunday. So we have a first question in the chat box and very current and one that a lot of people have been asking at the moment. And Paula asks to our panel, why do you think that the virus has been sent to us? by extension, has it been sent to us? Would any of our panel like to um, respond to that? Eileen, would you like to start? Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I think you're quite right, Alf. Um, I don't know if we can use the word sent to us. Um, it's, you know, in the history of humankind, there have always been um, such occurrences as what we're going through just now. Obviously, because of technology, we have a worldwide awareness of what's happening in other parts of the world. But I think we always, in any given circumstance, have to look for the good. And essentially, globally, it's making a lot of people look at their lives and what is really important and what that you know is really meaningful what they value um, so we have to look at in a crisis of what um, sustains us from the inside and crisis comes from the word Greek and it essentially means a moment to decide 
So we're having to look at new ways of living and not just live a life where we're looking at our own needs, but the needs of everybody everywhere else. And is my action going to affect somebody somewhere else? Um, indigenous people, um, First Nations people had a beautiful saying that we should always think seven generations ahead. And you see, we've become very short-sighted. Look at the state of the earth with global warning, warming. So we're really looking, we're being called to look at our way of life. Is it supporting and sustaining generations coming after us? Matthew, have you got, would you like to put any input into that question? I don't know, David. And that's the honest answer. I don't know. Uh... We've just got to live through it, do the best we can. And as Eileen said, it is created, um, it's created, obviously it's brought an awful lot of grief. I mean, as a minister, I've taken several funerals from people that have died of COVID um, and they may get a vaccine for it, but this is going to stay in communities and families for a long time. Because, you know, when you're limited, you can only have so many people at a funeral. Uh, at the moment in Southampton, it's 15, at one crematorium, and 18 is another. Graveside, it's only allowed, we're only allowed 10. Um, but you've just got to make the best you can and not looking at why, but looking at how we can work our way through it as best we can. Absolutely. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, we have some more questions. So I've been uh, given a question to ask, and I guess in the context of our spiritual development, uh, our panel is asked, and here we have the benefit of hindsight, what advice would you give yourself uh, at, when you were age 20, if you could go back and, and give yourself a bit of advice? I'm going to ask uh, Matthew to, to um, oh, you answer would. that first because um, he's, he's got further back to think than Eileen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not much. Just a couple uh, of years, Matthew. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I look back to the 20 year old, um, I didn't like the 20 year old, you know, the arrogance of youth. Um, and age really has taught me that you've just got to adapt. But as Eileen said uh, earlier on, when you, when you don't know how to deal with something, you can come at it from, from a sense of arrogance, or I don't I Eileen didn't use the word arrogance, from a sense of anger, um, like as a smoke screen. Um, but I would, I would hope that, that if there is that 20 year old, you know, wouldn't have had the arrogance that they had. But then the other side of the coin is if they didn't, I wouldn't be as wonderful and as marvelous as I am now. So <laughs> I like it. I like it, Matthew. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, we've heard, Eileen, that uh, certainly at 19 you had uh, a considerable change in your life's pathway. Uh, and your first medium, Gordon Higginson, wow, what a start. Um, so, just shine a light on the 20 year old Eileen. The 20 year old, I, what I've learned as I look back, I wish that I'd had more belief in my own self. I think that belief has been something that has slowly, I suppose, unfolded in my life. And when I was 19, and I remember sitting in the front row um, when there was a seminar on, wanting to ask a million questions and being too shy to actually do that. I was just bursting with wanting to ask things. So I think belief in my own self would be something that I um, would really, really say, uh, whatever age you are, if you can cultivate that. We don't suddenly wake up one morning and we're confident and we're full of belief, but if we can work on it and realize that, you know, whoever you are, wherever you are, you're just how you're meant to be. I always looked at my imperfections and um, I now know that, you know, there is perfection in imperfection. 
and it's the working towards becoming better, being better, that's really, really important. But I have to say that uh, being a spiritualist and knowing the power of the spirit and the constant support and love that's there, even though we may deny the spirit world or forget them, uh, their love is constant. And that's been something that for me, um, that has grown over the years that I didn't have when I was 20. Thanks, Arlene. Wonderful. Al. Okay, um, I'm going to ask another question uh, from the chat box as well. I'm asking them out of order here, but I will get around them all. Um, I'd like to ask the panel uh, on behalf of uh, Delana, I hope I pronounced your name right, um, if our panel feel that spiritualism has evolved or adapted to the modern world in ways that other religions have not. Wow, that's a that's a big big, <laughs> big big question there. So, would our panel uh, wish to comment whether they feel that that we've adapted as a religion, perhaps differently to others? Matthew, thanks. Um, well, because we're all volunteers, um, everyone that's involved in spiritualism. In one of our churches, um, they're all volunteers, and uh, many people do this from the goodness of their own heart. Progression is not always something that is embraced by people. And because spiritualism is such a broad ship, there isn't anybody says, well, you should do this or you shouldn't do that within the service context and how the church is run. Yes, in an administration aspect there is, but that's a different matter. Um, I can only talk from my own church's point of view, the one I'm a member of, and they've always embraced change. So I went into an environment where that was always encouraged. Um, but I have come across situations where people think they're progressing by staying in the same on the same path um we go we go back to the personal responsibility again um it whether it had spiritualism as an organization has progressed i would say it's tried to whether it's succeeded or not um it depends on people's perceptions because what's what's progress in one mind isn't progressing in others. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. Eileen? Um, that's a very interesting question. And as all questions, it's always relative. Um, are we touching the needs of the people? Are we communicating in the language that the young can identify with? Now, this is a question we must always ask ourselves because a spiritual church should be a living church where there is the pulse and the vibrancy of the spirit. And that has to be flexible and uh, constantly changing and embracing um, the new age, when I say new age, new thought flow that each generation brings with it. Now, Emma Hardinge Britton said something incredibly interesting she prophesied uh, the future of back into the you know current um, years that have gone that if spiritualism becomes um, more focused on the communication rather than the philosophy it will be classed as nothing more than entertainment now, whoa, that's a very, very interesting statement, isn't it, when you think about it? So we, I think it's very important that we keep the religious element in it, uh, but not in a stuffy way, in a real way, embracing it um, and loving each other and not judging. I, I personally feel there's a lot of judgment um, and we're always worried if we're good enough. And, you know, and I, I think that, we have to really be very broad visioned in the way we embrace people and accept people and keep the pulse 
and the essence of the spirit alive in what we're doing. And maybe what's happening now will open the door possibility that we are uh, encouraged to look at new ways. Absolutely. I, I support you 100 percent, Eileen, in what you're saying there, because in a few weeks time, many of us are going to be involved with taking that step uh, into the new normal uh, and, and reopening our churches and centres and perhaps having to learn to worship and develop in a slightly different way to what we've been used to over many, many years. And I think that we should take that as a wonderful opportunity. We should embrace that opportunity and not see it as a restriction, but rather opening up whole new possibilities. And I can seriously see spiritualism blossoming if only we can find it within the heart of ourselves to allow that blossom to come forward and to engage with everyone, many of whom are going to need the teachings and philosophy that spiritualism offers us. Next question, Al. Great perspectives there. Um, I have a question from Adam, but also one from Teresa. So I'm going to do my usual thing of squishing them together because I mm -hmm. think they, they complement each other. Um, and Adam is asking what can spiritualism do? And I, and I think we should be um, asked that actively into what is spiritualism doing as well uh, to bring more spirituality to people and to spiritualize people. And Teresa is also asking as well about what hope there is going forward. And it seems to me that those, quest those questions seem to go together about how we encourage and nurture people's spirituality and, and how that brings hope. I wonder what our panel thought about those questions. Eileen, would you like to begin? Um, absolutely. Well, I think we can't be aware of other realities and other dimensions until first we're aware of this level. And that means we're aware of our own selves. And we learn to have self-acceptance and not be judgmental and really love ourselves unconditionally. If we can do that, then we can um, have the capacity uh, to be non-judgmental and uh, loving and kind where other people are concerned. So I think essentially, if we incorporate more spiritual practices, um, and make it uh, interwoven into what we're doing. Uh, a lot of it is obviously um, within mediumistic development, but it's about development of the self uh, and be aware, really aware of who we are and allowing our lives to be a living testimony to what we believe and know to be true. And, you know, how can we teach? The only real way we can teach is by example. You know, Albert Schweitzer, um, going back a long time, the missionary, he was asked, how do you teach children? And he said, there are three ways, by example, by example, and by example. And St. Augustine was once asked to go out into the world and preach. And when you have to, speak. So you see, it's by our example. We can't, you know, if we say words, words can be empty if they don't carry the intention of our heart. Uh, within to what we're doing. So we need to, I believe, incorporate um, more uh, gentle spiritual practices. And that's where I think we can share and learn from other religious and spiritual traditions. I think that's very, very important. You know, uh, be a little bit eclectic. You can still, you know, um, say that you're a spiritualist, but look at other spiritual traditions. What do they do? What practices? You know, we speak about loving kindness, metta, and mindfulness. When we're really mindful, we're totally present. And when we have um, a sense of being present, we develop presence. It's very, very powerful. It's very, very beautiful. So, but we need to encourage more um, spiritual practices, I think. And prayer. Matthew mentioned prayer earlier. You know, real prayer is to liberate the inner voice of the eternal. Real prayer is to feel the prayer. It's not just words, it has to come from a full heart. We have to feel it. And in the, the act of prayer, we feel at one with all life. That's very important. Thank you. 
Thank you, Eileen. Matthew? Um, I would encourage healing more in the movement. Um, for many years, healing has been looked upon as the poor relation. I know it isn't now, but for many years it was. And uh, from my experience of teaching, if you'd say to a group, who's a clairvoyant, you know, the hand goes up, who's a healer, and that happens. Um, and if we, can, if we can promote more the healing side, that's going to give people the confidence. It's, it's, it's going to help them to, well, rewire their mind, actually, because um, if someone has been conditioned to think in a certain way, they may not think it's possible for them to think in another way. And we, we, all, we know that the power of healing has no boundaries. Um, and miracles, miracles can, and, and they do happen. So I, I would be inclined to, to answer that question in the healing way. We look at Harry Edwards when he demonstrated, um, you know, the, the Albert Hall, he filled the Albert Hall many, many times. Because his healing was such that people could, would see a difference. That classic story about the boy who went and sat on the po on the stage and he, he was wearing a phonic ear, which in those days was a big thing that they would have and they'd wear around the neck. And he, he, he was, this boy was deaf. He was deaf. His, the hearing, the phonic thing gave him a little bit of hearing. Well, Edwards, he took off the phonic ear and gave him the healing uh, as uh, he did, uh, remarkably so. And when the healing finished, he clicked his fingers and the boy went like that. A miracle had taken place. It's amazing. We don't, we, we, we don't, I don't believe we celebrate enough the power that we know of in spiritualism. That's where I'd like to see it go forward. Thank you, Matthew. And obviously, when um, we come back to healing within our churches, because of social distancing, it is unlikely that certainly in the beginning, we're going to be able to give contact healing. So I think that's going to teach us all the power of true attunement and the reality that healing is, is more than actually the physical touch. Uh, and I think that's going to be important also. Very much. Distance healing, David, does, as you know, distance healing works. It does, absolutely, yes. So maybe that's about giving the confidence to our healers to appreciate that and what a difference they can make. And I, like you, Matthew, I, I, I champion our healers. I think they do some amazing work and uh, we need to encourage them to, mm. to push their hands up and be proud. Al. Yeah, great perspective there and uh, really good to hear as well. Uh, very hopeful, I think. I'm going to ask a question now on behalf of Ben. I hope I get this right. Uh, so Ben has pointed out that quite obviously there are people here on earth uh, who help to organize the, spirit, uh, the religion of spiritualism. But he's wondering whether there are, I guess, counterparts in the spirit world who equally do some organizing. So I, I guess in terms of spirituality, that question is, is going towards the question are there people in the spirit world who help us to organize and orchestrate our spirituality? Interesting I'm, question. Just, I, I'm just envisaging a national executive committee in the spirit world and um, yeah, that's interesting. I wonder if their minutes are as long as ours but I, I'm, I'm, uh, I digress. Um, I don't I think that's even possible. <laughs> <laughs> do our, do our panellists have any thoughts about that, about what's going on in the spirit world uh, in, in terms of organising things? Eileen, would you like to begin? Of course. I, well, I absolutely believe that everything that we do, uh, you know, even maybe in our everyday lives, not necessarily departmentalising when we're working or communicating with the spirit world or healing, um, because our life should really be 
a sense of being aware of that which is sacred but I do believe we're helped and assisted I know that as a medium I, I can never work without the help and assistance of those in the other world you know without them it doesn't happen and I think that we should have a sense of confident humility so I am representing on the front line rep presenting the spirit and if you're a healer it's exactly the same but who knows what great lengths the other world go to to make it happen just to make it work um, and I think that probably we won't ever know till we pass over ourselves uh, because it's just a miracle you know how often do we hear from our pioneers their interest in what we're doing hasn't diminished on passing um, on the contrary, I think it's in some ways intensified because they see the collective need of mankind. And so I think, you know, there are maybe sort of layers of help and support that ripples through uh, the dimensions. Who knows? There is so much, what we know is tiny, isn't it? It's a drop in comparison with what we don't know. And we'll only ever see things from our perspective but we can't experience what we don't believe and so i feel we have to open the windows of our awareness and invite all possibilities in we know that spirit is superior to matter and there's nothing the other world can't do so i think it you know it affords us to um realize that we are part of this collective whole and this vast symphony if you want of, of love whereby those in the other world are working on our behalf. Matthew? Um, listening to Eileen, I was reminded of um, um, something I, I, I read from Bob Bunnell. Uh, it, there was a seance taking place in Silver Birch. They're, they're, they're in this little terrace house somewhere in London. And Silver Birch said to um, who was the guide of Barbanel in the trans state, said tonight, we have brought over 3,000 souls to this meeting to show them that it is possible to communicate with your world. Now, when you read that in print, your logical mind thinks straight away, well, hang on a minute, they're in a little terrace. Yeah. Where are they gonna go, 3,000 souls? But you see, because we're thinking about it in the physical sense. Um, equally, you know, when we say, are there people? Um, I would rather say there's a power rather than people. Uh, and through the power, you've got the communion of spirits and the ministry of angels. There's, there's got to be a light from there that's allowing the light from here to extend the light out from spirit through spirit to spirit so yes it, there is there is a chain there is there is a chain of power thank you matthew i wonder if we ever fully appreciate how much inspiration we get from the spirit world and ideas that come that we we run with and how many we we just miss they just pass us by but uh, perhaps we'll never know al yeah, we have another question in the queue. Um, I'd like to ask our panel on behalf of Emma. Uh, and Emma mentions that, understandably, we do have rules and regulations in our world. Um, but she wonders whether too many rules and regulations and limitations that we impose on ourselves actually affect our eternal progress and our spirituality. Um, an interesting thought there. Matthew? Okay, Emma, there's only one sense you need. It's called common sense. Mm -hmm. And that's my answer to the question. Thank you. Eileen? Short but yes. sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, when when Emma was speaking about rules, yes, of course, we have to adhere to rules if we're a spiritual healer. And we always have to come from a place of deep sensitivity and responsibility and awareness, like whether we're the channel for communication. You know, we, we always need to use the power of awareness of other people's 
um, feelings. And yes, common sense, I think, as Matthew so rightly said, um, I don't think we can limit ourselves when we come from a place of, of loving kindness, you know, because the intent of our loving kindness will be um, manifest in our life. Thank you. Thanks, oh, Riley. I we, think we've got time for one more. Please, one more. Question. Yeah, a uh, quick question here, um, and it comes from Brian. Uh, and, and Brian is really talking about our pioneers who, in the past, often came up through the lyceums or were involved in the lyceums. Uh, and is it possible that they gain their spirituality in that way? But perhaps uh, just to make that question more accessible to, to everyone, uh, you know, we have the Lyceum Manual, but are we able to develop our spirituality through the things that we read and, and the texts that we have access to? So a quick question there that doesn't sound quick. <laughs> Filene. Okay. Okay, well, I think obviously nourishing the mind, what we read um, it is, can be very um, in, you know, informative, it can nourish us. I think that there comes a point when we have to look at the quality of our thinking. Um, the Sufis have a wonderful saying that before you do anything, it must pass through three gates. Is it kind, is it necessary, and is it true? So yes, the quality of our thinking, the quality of our thoughts, what we read will obviously help us, um, but then we have to apply it. We have to live a life um, where we're nourishing that which is within us. So important. Matthew? Um, I'm being pressed to, I've just written something down. Don't believe what you read, live what you believe. Because that book is that one man or woman's opinion. It's coming from a place of their own spirit. But if somebody says, you've got to do it this way, well, you might not be able to. Because your, 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 your psychology and everything is thinking at it from, from a different angle. So if you are going to read, and I agree with Eileen, we, we have to study, we, we need to study, we need to look at other cultures. We can't become one street spiritualist um, because spiritualism is, is like a grain of sand on the beach from the other tr all the other truths. But let's live our spirituality and, uh, and that which we believe. And don't chase rainbows in life, make them. Amazing. Thank you, Matthew. We are almost out of time. And I'm going to hand back to Minister David Bruton for the final word. David. Well, I just want to begin by thanking both Eileen and Matthew. We've had a brilliant evening. Thoroughly enjoyed listening to your thoughts, your opinions, the wisdom of your words. And it's, it's been fantastic. And I'm sure all the guests have uh, taken a great deal um, to help them on their spiritual journey. Um, I have to tell you that next week uh, our subject is spirit art and orographs. And our guests will be Stella Upton and Sue Wood, both fine exponents of this particular aspect of spiritualism. So it promises to be an equally interesting evening. And can I also remind you that the 29th of June will be the last in, the se in this series of audience with the president. And I asked, I appealed last week for suggestions of what you, you would like the discussion subject to be. I've had quite a few people that have emailed me uh, with various suggestions, but there's still time over the next couple of days. If there's a burning subject that you'd like us to explore, please email, email me. Um, at president at snu.org.uk and um, Alva's put it up in the chat box and we'll see what we can come up with for our last Monday together at the end of June. Uh, audience of the president, with the president, I hope will be coming back to us later in the year. We are unlikely to be a weekly event but um, 
I think we've certainly opened a rich seam here and we've certainly seen evidence of that tonight. So again, thank you to everyone for joining us and thank you to Matthew and to Eileen for being our guest panelists this evening. Alf? Thank you, David. And I'd also like to echo that and thank Eileen and Matthew as well. And also to thank you, our audience, because it's your questions that help to shape the journey that the discussion goes on. And we find out perhaps things that we haven't even thought of before. And as we shine a light on different corners of spiritualism and today, spirituality. So thank you all for joining us and we'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Do take care and God bless. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.